Hello. Um, so I can only apologise for the state of this video. Um, essentially, I've had technical difficulties over the last 12 hours and short of uh, screaming, shouting and uh, lots of swearing, I have decided to just do a, a kind of very rudimentary video um, describing the tongue, pharynx, esophagus and stomach. But uh, over the course of the weekend, I will update this and make it a little bit more entertaining for you guys. So um, please bear with. It's not through want of trying. I've tried very hard, uh, but my laptop is shortly going to fly through the window unless I can just get some kind of information delivery out to you. So as mentioned, we are going to be looking at the tongue, pharynx, esophagus and stomach. Um, as part of introduction to the oral environment um, and there are going to be lots of words said during this lecture so um, please bear with but I will try and make it more entertaining for you over the weekend and you can um, you can come and have a look at that. Okay so before we move on to the soft tissues of the mouth and throat um, we need to just kind of have a look at some bony landmarks first so here we've got a, a posterior view of let me get my laser pointer we've got a posterior view of the mandible um, and we have this free floating bone in the neck called the hyoid bone uh, and a lot of our muscles that we are going to be interested in today are going to have uh, some kind of attachments to one or both of these bony landmarks. So if we orient ourselves with this picture we have got some superior genial tubercles up here um, and tubercles are essentially bony growths that um, provide nice rigid uh, attachment sites for muscles and we have them all over our body um, and we have um, the hyoid bone down here. So we're looking at this from the back, uh, which is why we have the kind of the molars here and the incisors over here. So the two muscles that we are going to talk about now are not um, muscles of the tongue, but they are muscles of the floor of the mouth. So it's really important that we discuss these and um, they have an action which um, essentially prevents us from uh, choking and stuff by elevating the hyoid uh, and pulling the uh, which will pull the larynx which is below it out of the way um, during chewing and swallowing. So the first muscle we're going to look at is the mylohyoid. So this, <clears throat> excuse me, so this muscle originates on the medial body of the mandible and inserts onto the hyoid bone. And it's innervated um, by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve and specifically it's innervated by the nerve to mylohyoid. And its action is to elevate the floor of our mouth and our hyoid bone. So that's how this works. And then the other one we're interested in is the geniohyoid. And these insert onto these superior genial tubercles here. Uh, so they originate on the anterior body of the mandible, which is these superior um, genial tubercles. And then they insert themselves onto the hyoid bone. So these are more medial, um, whereas these are more lateral and kind of almost fan-shaped, they're, uh, they're flatter muscle. And these are innervated by a spinal nerve, so these are innervated by the uh, nerve to the geniohyoid, which is from the C1, C2 region of the neck. And this action, um, the action of this muscle helps to elevate the hyoid. And we can see uh, a couple of these muscles or both of these muscles in this picture. So we have the uh, mylohyoid 
and then we have the geniohyoid uh, on top and these are kind of forming, forming the floor of the mouth and on this picture here we are looking up at the mandible so this is the bottom border of the mandible and this is kind of the neck region and and this muscle that we're looking at here is the mylohyoid uh, we also have on this image the anterior belly of the digastric muscle, which we looked at when we were looking um, at the triangles of the neck. So these are the learning objectives that you should be able to cover once um, you have watched this lecture and um, uh, done any further study. I should point out at this point, although I have said that I will be re-recording and trying to iron out my technical difficulties, the content will not be any different between the two videos. However, the delivery will. Um, and that's the only important bit. You will be able to complete all learning objectives by watching one video or the other. There will not be kind of any extra information that will be relevant for assessment. Um, or being able to complete these learning objectives. So these learning objectives are to be able to describe the musculature of the tongue and name the sensory and the motor nerve supplies to the tongue. We are going to be able to define the terms the nasopharynx, oropharynx and laryngopharynx and these are all form part of the pharynx itself. So these are subdivisions of the pharynx. We will be able to describe the muscular structure of the pharynx, describe the muscular structure of the esophagus and compare it with that of the pharynx. Uh, describe the part of the esophagus as it passes from the pharynx to the stomach. And then we're going to look at some kind of clinical implications of this where we are going to uh, understand why it is that uh, things like liver disease, so cirrhosis of the liver, um, or, you know, there's kind of other diseases, but it's largely cirrhosis of the liver, can induce esophageal varices. So esophageal varices are um, essentially like varicose veins of the leg, but instead of in the leg, they are within the esophagus. So the first thing we are going to look at is the tongue and the muscles of the tongue. And we divide um, the muscles of the tongue into extrinsic muscles of the tongue. So these are muscles that start on the outside of the tongue and um, insert into the tongue. Uh, and then we're also going to look at intrinsic muscles of the tongue, where the whole muscle is within the tongue itself. So the extrinsic muscles of the tongue. Um, these are ones that are said, you know, start from outside the tongue and attach into the tongue in order to make it, um, you know, function, kind of do something that we want it to do. So the first one that we're interested in is the genioglossus. And this is a large fan-shaped tongue. And this is um, forming most of the tongue itself, okay? So we've got this large fan shape. It's insert... Um, it originates on um, the uh, spine of the mandible, so the mental spine of the mandible. So this is just behind our chin, um, just kind of on the deep surface of the mandible at our chin. And this is fanning out. So we have all these kind of fibres here that are fanning out um, and inserting on the dorsum of the tongue. So the dorsum is the underside of the tongue. And that's innervated by cranial nerve 12, okay, which is the hypoglossal nerve. Um, the next muscle is this really nice, flat, kind of quadrangular shape, so uh, rectangle or squarish shaped um, muscle here. And this muscle originates, this is the hyoglossus, which originates on the hyoid bone, which we can see down here. Um, and inserts onto the inferior aspect of the lateral tongue. So this inserts onto um, the, the sides of the tongue near the rear of the tongue, okay? And again, 
this is innervated by the hypoglossal nerve. So this is cranial nerve 12. And we will briefly look at cranial nerve 12 in a little while. So um, uh, we'll, we will come back to this. We also have the styloglossus, which is this muscle here. And as the name suggests, it originates from the styloid process of the temporal bone. So that spiky bit of um, bone in the temporal region. And it inserts into the, uh, the posterior side of the tongue. So it's blending with the hyoglossus muscles. And we can see kind of this blending happening down here. Um, and the posterior tongue, so the, you know, in a similar region. So these muscles, the hyoglossus and the styloglossus, have a similar insertion point um, and largely blended fibres. Uh, once again, this is innervated by the hypoglossal nerve, which is, again, cranial nerve 12. And we also have, finally, the palatoglossus. So this is this muscle that's uh, as when we look at the name uh, suggests that it comes from the palate so this is coming from the palate <coughs> um, and inserting on the posterolateral tongue so it's merging with the intrinsic muscles which we will come on to in a little while um, but the, the importance of this is that it's it's coming from the palate so the palatine aponeurosis and because it's coming from the palate, it has a slightly different um, innovation. And this is from cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve. Now, if you think back to um, HHP, we looked at the vagus nerve for the innovation of the heart. And um, as I mentioned during those practicals, the vagus nerve has a lot of very important roles throughout the body um, and the uh, the palate is one of those and we will also come in to look at its role in the larynx um, in a later lecture but this is parasympathetic supply so this is the supply that helps um, is the we have the, the the autonomic nervous system so we have the, the kind of like the fight and flight responses and the parasympathetic are the ones that kind of help bring us back to baseline from like a flight stage, you know. Um, so <clears throat> innovation to the muscles of the palate um, and therefore the glossus is cranial nerve 10. And we can see some of these muscles in uh, situ. So we are looking at a sagittal section here. So this is where the teeth would be if this cadaver had got teeth. Um, but we could see, you know, the kind of the very front part of the uh, mandible. So this is the mental region of the mandible. We could see the hard palate on the top. And this is this space here is the oral cavity. So we're looking from a side on perspective of the tongue. And we could see the genioglossus. No, we can't. Yes, we can. We can see the genioglossus, which is this large fan shape that is starting outside of the tongue. So it started on the um, genial tubercles at the mandible and inserting into the tongue. And it's this large kind of fan shaped muscle here. On this image, on the right-hand side, we can see the hyoglossus. So this is this um, quadrilateral shape. And just coming down from here, we can see the styloglossus, which was um, inserting into the fibres here, both of which then go on to insert into the lateral aspect of the tongue. Now, interestingly, on this image, on this cadaveric image, we can also see this nerve coming down here. Now, this is the hypoglossal nerve. So this is the one that's coming to um, innervate most of these muscles of the tongue in general. But we can also see this other nerve here, this lingual nerve, uh, which is part of the trigeminal um, nerve uh, in specific. It's part of the 
third branch, so the mandibular branch, um, and entering the floor of the mouth there. So let's go and have a look at the uh, intrinsic muscles of the tongue. So we have uh, four that we are interested in. Um, and let's uh, kind of orient ourselves. So we've got the hyoid here. And we've got um, a coronal section of the mandible here. So we've we've kind of cut down the front of somebody's face. We've like put like um, almost like put somebody's push somebody's face into you know a, a meat slicer. Uh, apologies for being so graphic, but I don't really know how else I can describe a coronal section without you being able to see my physical action. So we've got the uh, hyoid bone. And then we've got this uh, this band of connective tissue that runs down the middle, which is called the lingual septum. So <clears throat> we have um, four muscles that we are interested in today for the intrinsic muscles. So we have the superior longitudinal fibres. So these are running lengthways within the tongue. And uh, these originate on the median fibrous septum. So they originate here and they insert into the margins of the tongue. OK. Uh, these are innervated by the hypoglossal nerve as well. We have um, an inferior patch. So wherever we have something that's superior, we must also have something that's inferior. So we have inferior longitudinal nerves down here. And these originate on the root of the tongue and on the hyoid bone. So these are coming all the way down this side. Um, and we have obviously a matching set down the other side as well. And these insert onto the apex of the tongue. So right onto the tip of the tongue. And again, we're seeing a repeated pattern where we have cranial nerve 12, so the hypoglossal nerve which is innovating these muscles. We also have some transverse fibres. So this picture is not very clear, which is one of the reasons why I'm wanting to do a uh, another video fixing this, for which I do demonstrate that these muscles aren't clear. But we have these kind of transverse fibres. So these are running in this direction, if you look at the direction of the mouse. These are running in this direction, and they originate on the median fibrous septum and insert onto the lateral tongue. Uh, they are innervated once again by the hypoglossal nerve. And within this kind of mesh of side to side running um, transverse muscle fibres, we also have like a cross hatch created by some vertical muscle fibres, which are running now in this direction, if you look at the mouse. So these originate on the dorsum of the tongue, so that's the underside of the tongue, and insert onto the inferior border of the tongue. And once again, these muscles are innervated by cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve. So we have a slightly different image here. Uh, a similar angle, but slightly uh, clearer-ish. Um, so we have the geniohyoid and the mylohyoid muscles down here, and then we can see what would be the anterior belly of the digastric, okay, this kind of little group here. And then we have these uh, extrinsic muscles, so we have the platoglossus, the styloglossus, the genio, and the hyoglossus, okay, which are these down the side here and then finally we have the intrinsic muscles of the tongue so we have the superior longitudinal muscle and we could kind of see these uh, these fibers uh, stretched along along in this direction but we can see this where there's you know a very obvious border in reality it is not like this but um, th we have this very obvious border followed by the, the transverse and the vertical muscles, which again are all kind of cross-hatch mass. Um, 
for which uh, we have the fibres going in the two opposite opposing directions. And we have the inferior longitudinal muscles at the very dorsum of the tongue, so at the very underside of the tongue. So the genioglossus is responsible for depression, so that's lowering the tongue and protrusion, so that's sticking it out. And also because of its fan shape, because we've got these fibres going in different directions, it can also do retraction and sideways movement. So this tongue is, uh, this muscle is really important for um, lots and lots of movements within the mouth because obviously it's forming quite a large part of the tongue. We have the uh, the hyoglossus muscle, so that's this one here, which is responsible for depression and retraction of the tongue. Okay, so it pushes the tongue down or pulls the tongue down, I should say, rather than pushes, and retracts the tongue. We have the oh, mouse is going mad. We have the styloglossus muscle, so that's this muscle here. Uh, which is responsible for retraction and curling the sides. So people that have the ability to like, roll their tongue, they have good control over the styloglossus. We have the palatio, um glossus muscle as well, which is up here. And these elevate the posterior tongue. So these elevate the, the back region of the tongue and display depress the soft palate. So this is really important if you are chewing and um and need to cough during chewing, they will they will pull the platoglossus uh, uh they will pull the pharynx out of the way so that we don't um swallow food when we are not ready to. Um we have the superior longitudinal fibers which elevate the apex and the sides. So these create like um like a cup-like motion, um, which is really good for uh, swallowing in the sense that we create like a, a trough for food to slip down exactly where we want it to go. And um, also used for retraction and curling the tongue upwards. So when we're curling the tongue to... Uh, um, uh, rub across the, to uh, the front of our teeth, upwards, so the maxillary teeth, we are using the superior longitudinal fibres. So the inferior longitudinal fibres have kind of um, an opposing kind of ox op um, action. So they curl the tongue downwards and depress the apex. So in the event that we are trying to um, uh, rub our tongue along our mandibular teeth, down at the bottom these are the inferior longitudinal fibers that are helping with this and also uh, we rely on them for retraction as well so we have the transverse fibers which are part of this um, cross hatch that we talked about and these um, narrow the tongue to for protrusion so if we're trying to make our tongue look kind of long and skinny as we're sticking it out of our mouth, we are engaging these transverse, whereas uh, on the opposite of that, we have these vertical fibres which flatten and broaden the tongue. So let's have a look at the hypoglossal nerve. So we briefly saw it on the cadaveric image, but this is the hypoglossal nerve that is uh, the cranial nerve 12. So it's coming directly from the brain um, rather than the spinal nerves. So we have uh, the hypoglossus coming down here and where it's going to innervate all of the intrinsic um, and extrinsic muscles of the tongue except palatioglossus, which we discussed because it's largely uh, palate based. This is the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10. So here we have two images of the same tongue. You have been briefly introduced to this during the uh, skull and uh, oral cavity intro where we looked at kind of sort of landmarks within the oral cavity things like the vestibule and and the folds um, we saw these images 
So we consider the tongue in uh, two thirds and one thirds. So we don't consider it half and half, we consider it two thirds and one third, where we have the sulcus terminalis that separates these two. So the anterior two thirds, the facial nerve is responsible for taste. Okay, so if we are tasting within this region, the, uh, it's the facial nerve that is responsible for that. And for general sensation, we have the lingual, which we discussed briefly um, a few minutes ago, which is a branch of the trigeminal nerve, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. So that's V3. We also have the posterior uh, third, which is um, innervated differently. So this is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, and uh, it's way beyond what you need to understand. Um, but it, it's largely to do with the anatomy and the kind of the, the, the course of these nerves. So don't worry about it. All you need to know is that the posterior third is innervated, uh, taste and general sensation are both done by the glossopharyngeal, whereas the anterior two thirds, we have the facial nerve providing the taste sensation and the general um, sensation, so rubbing your tongue across, uh, rubbing your finger across your tongue or food in your mouth is felt by the lingual branch, which is from the trigeminal nerve, the mandibular division. Okay, so learning objectives again, right, we have covered the musculature of the tongue and we have been able to name the motor and sensory. So now what we're going to go and do is we're going to go and have a look at the pharynx and um, we divide the pharynx into three portions. We have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx and that is what we will look at now. So on this picture of the left, um, I appreciate that this is kind of a sort of a 3D representation, block light representation of um, trying to make something that's actually quite complicated into something that's very simple. So we have the oral cavity here and this would be the nasal cavity. So this is where, our, um, where we looked at the uh, bony landmarks. We briefly touched on the nasal cavity. And the oral cavity is uh, the area of the mouth. So where the tongue is sitting, we could kind of see a representation of that. So if we were to draw our nostrils on, they would kind of be on here and here like this. You know, we could see we've got this dividing septum um, down the two. And our pharynx sits behind this. So our pharynx is the portion of the body that um, connects the... Uh, the oral and the nasal cavity and um, uh, the esophagus. So this is kind of like the bridgeway, that the connecting pathway. So we have the nasopharynx, which is just the portion behind the nasal cavity and the oropharynx, which is the portion of the pharynx that is behind the oral cavity. And finally, we have the laryngopharynx, which is just the space behind the larynx. So if we were to sit the larynx here, that would form our airway. So this kind of represents the epiglottis of the oropharynx. No, larynx. Sorry, I'm making words up now. Um, this would be like the epiglottis of the larynx. So we can see some of the muscles in which we have looked at um, today. So we have the um, platoglossus muscle, which is this one here. So we can see that it's largely from the um, the palate. So which is why we consider it a um, uh, which is why we know that it has the you know the different innovation. So we have um, the tongue within the uh, oral cavity. And then we have these kind of these three spaces behind uh, that all come together to form the pharynx. So let's go and have a look at what it actually looks like. So it's very small compared to uh, the representation of the previous slide. 
So in situ, it's even smaller than it appreci than we appreciate from diagrams. So we have the nasopharynx here, which is this portion behind the nasal cavity. So all of this is the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx sits right behind. But as we can see in our cadaveric image, it's actually um, kind of a very compressed, very small area. And then we have the oropharynx. So the oropharynx is the bit that's kind of bridging the nasopharynx to the laryngopharynx. And this sits behind the soft palate and superiorly to the epiglottis of the um, larynx. And then finally, we have our laryngolarynx, which, so if this is our larynx, which I appreciate we haven't covered just yet, um, but we will be doing soon. The laryngopharynx is this kind of squash tube that's sat behind. And all of these, it's really important to understand, are interconnected. So they're, they're a seamless transition that we as anatomists kind of just divide up according to where it is rather than whether it does anything kind of different. You know, but we have three outer circular muscles and these are constrictors. So these are the ones that are helping to compress and squeeze things down or protect airways depending on their role. And then we have uh, deep to those, we have three inner longitudinal muscles on each side. And all of these, apart from one, are innervated by the vagus nerve. So this is the parasympathetic um, fibres that are innervating the pharynx like the um, palate that we briefly touched on. So we have these outer circular muscles and these are our constrictors. And in anatomy, we like to say what we see. So we just label them as the superior constrictor, the middle constrictor and the inferior constrictor. So it's nice and simple, superior, middle and inferior. And these are the outermost muscles of the larynx and they all have a common um, insertion point which when we look posteriorly so this is us looking from the back so uh, we are looking kind of in that direction and which is what we can see here which is called the pharyngeal wraith so they all originate uh, they all insert onto the pharyngeal wraith uh, so the superior constrictor originates on the pterygomandibular wraith. So we looked at that when we looked at the buccinator muscle. So this is the divide between the kind of the facial muscles and the pharynx. We have this pterygomandibular wraithy here. Um, <clears throat> sometimes in cadavers, or quite a lot, in, uh, quite often in cadavers, um, the buccinator and the superior constrictor look continuous. Um, they're not, they look continuous, uh, but depending on where they fall kind of outside this raphe, um, it depends on whether it's, you know, buccinator or superior constrictor, but both muscles are incredibly important. important. And these insert onto the occipital bone. So these insert here onto the occipital bone and we have fibres kind of coming together uh, towards this pharyngeal raphe, which is just this um, fibrous connective tissue that's kind of down the middle where both sides meet. So um, the middle pharyngeal constrictor it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's the middle and it is a constrictor. So this insert, uh, this uh, um, originates from the stylohyoid ligament. So we can see the styloid process here and we've got this ligament that's coming down between that and the hyoid. And that is where this middle constrictor muscle uh, originates from. And it travels around the back onto the pharyngeal raphe. So you've got one on each side, one coming this way, one coming down what would be the patient's right. And they're coming around the back and inserting onto the raphe. And then we have our uh, inferior pharyngeal constrictor, so our final one. 
and this originates on the thyroid and cricoid cartilage so when we come to look at the um the larynx in a later lecture this is the thyroid cartilage and just beneath it we have the cricoid cartilage here so this is where the inferior constrictor uh, originates from and it's coming around the back to join uh, with the pharyngeal raphe so down the middle so it's nice kind of transition down the middle um at the bottom we have a slightly different change of direction we have a different uh kind of pattern so we have two very obvious muscles um coming here but then towards the bottom what we have is uh, it's part of the inferior constrictor but instead of being in like two halves these have seamlessly come together and bound around the whole thing okay so it's just one long continuous loop rather than two halves coming together to join in the middle and this is where the transition into the esophagus is happening and we'll look in a little while but this is like because of this change of shape and this change of um uh fiber patterns um we have like a weakness here but this is coming into the esophagus we also have the three inner longitudinal muscles so these are inner so the um the pharynx has constrictors on the outside and longitudinal muscles on the inside and we have the plato pharyngeus here so if we follow that up we can see and that originates on the hard palate like the name suggests and inserts onto the thyroid cartilage and the side of the pharynx and the esophagus okay so it's a it's a kind of long swoopy muscle we also have the salpingopharyngeus which originates on the uh, pharyngotympanic tube so this is up here and this is the tube that kind of connects the inner ear to the pharynx so when you are um, in an aeroplane or going diving or driving up a hill really quickly and you feel the sensation that your ears need to pop and you can kind of pinch your nose and blow air into your mouth, this is um, the tube that is connecting the uh, eardrum, so the tympanic membrane, which is kind of sat sort of here-ish, um, to your pharynx. So this is the tube that allows you to do that and at the bottom of this tube, we have this palato, um, palatopharyngeus muscle. Uh, sorry, salpingopharyngeus muscle. Um, and so this is merging with the fibres from the palatopharyngeus uh, muscle. So these fibres are merging into one. And in actual cadavers, uh, it is really, really difficult to tell the difference between the two. So, which is why we use nice textbook images for this kind of thing. And finally, we have the uh, stylopharyngeus muscle. So this is going to originate on the styloid process like we have looked at um, numerous times before now um, and inserts onto the thyroid cartilage. So this is the cartilage of the larynx. And all of these muscles together act to elevate the pharynx and the larynx while swallowing and speaking. So it's quite important that we have the larynx out of the way when we are swallowing food because we want to protect our airways. So we pull it uh, superiorly during swallowing to keep it out of the way, which kind of seems a bit counterproductive. But it allows for easier folding of the epiglottis, which is... Um, uh, a kind of a, a gateway if you like that closes when we swallow to prevent us aspirating on food and all of these are innervated by the vagus nerve so that's cranial nerve 10 except the stylopharyngeus and so this muscle here which is innervated by uh, cranial nerve 9 which is the glossopharyngeal um nerve so again it's a cranial nerve so it's coming directly from the brain um and it's not um not a spinal nerve like we think of for the rest of the body okay so we have now looked at the pharynx um 
and we've looked at the the muscles of the pharynx and we know how that we have the constrictors on the outside and the longitudinal muscles on the inside but we're going to compare that now to the esophagus so we're going to take a step further down the body and uh, look at the esophagus as it passes from the pharynx to the stomach. So the uh, pharynx we can see kind of up here. So these are the constrictor muscles. So we have the inferior constrictor muscles here. And the esophagus is starting underneath after this kind of change of direction of the fibres. So we don't need to know a great deal about the esophagus, but what we do need to know is that the constrictors, so these circular muscles in the esophagus are the opposite way round to those found in the, um, the pharynx. So we have the constrictors in the esophagus on the inside, whilst the longitudinal muscles are on the outside. I briefly touched on um, the space kind of where the inferior uh, constrictor muscles kind of change their form and instead of kind of inserting onto this pharyngeal raphe, they just come round as one solid unit. And this is an anatomical weak area and this can lead to uh, Zenker's diverticulum. So what can happen is, is this weak area can bulge out um, and form space in uh, behind the pharynx as such um, where we can collect food and uh, this can be like a kind of a cause of you know sort of halitosis and um, as bacteria and foodie bits are kind of gathered and stored in this area. Um, there is some degree of control because we still have muscles there so you know we can still kind of force um, foodstuffs out um, where it's kind of re-swallowed which is um, uh, re-swallowed and then you know but largely this would be a surgical intervention in order to be able to um, repair this. So we have the esophagus and I think when we looked in the um, the DR we had uh, we had some cadavers with esophagi uh, esophaguses, esophagi, mm, lots of esophagus um, in place. So the esophagus is travelling from the pharynx, which we have already discussed, um, and it's travelling down the posterior mediastinum. So it's behind the uh, trachea. So this is the trachea here with its cartilage on, which we looked at during the thorax. And it's traveling behind that kind of, uh, kind of centralized as it reaches the diaphragm, we get this, this turning. So it travels quite medially, quite centralized. And then it turns as it pierces the diaphragm, which is where it enters the stomach. So we have, um, you know, three parts. We have the cervical part, which is the the very beginnings uh, where food is first uh, met, where food first leaves the pharynx. We have the cervical part of the esophagus, followed by the thoracic part or the mediastinal part in some cases, depending on what you want to call it. And then finally, we have a very small section of abdominal esophagus as it enters the uh, as it passes through the diaphragm and into the stomach. So the stomach um, is this J-shaped pouch here. Um, and it's got, uh, you know, considerable muscles. Um, you know, it's got longitudinal and it's got circular muscles in that kind of churn food up. So food is passing from the esophagus through a sphincter here and into um, acidy soup where it is getting uh, bashed about and we have like the you know the beginnings of mechanical digestion and chemical digestion going on within the stomach before it passes out through a pyloric sphincter 
and then into the duodenum, which is the first part of the intestine, where it's uh, the acid that is passed out with is neutralised and the uh, chemical breakdown of foodstuffs um, allows it to start the process of absorption as it's passing through the rest of the intestine. Now, what you can't see is you can't see the duodenum, and that's because it's covered by this large fatty sac, which is called the greater omentum. You don't need to worry about that because this is just an introduction to the stomach, so don't worry too much. But this is what it actually looks like versus what textbooks normally uh, normally show it to be. So the liver is sat up here, and just beneath the liver we have this pyloric sphincter, which is the end sphincter of the stomach that passes food from this direction all the way through and into the duodenum. So we have looked at the tongue, the um, the motor supply of the tongue. We've looked at the pharynx and the three divisions of the pharynx. And we have touched on the esophagus and briefly touched on the stomach. But now we need to look at how uh, liver diseases can cause um, esophageal varices. So this is the stomach. We've got the liver up here. We've got the stomach down here. And this is the pyloric sphincter region that I was talking about in um, the last slide with the duodenum, which is this little uh, pink bit that's left here that travels uh, sort of deep to the transverse colon. And the blood supply to the um, coming from, so th we're talking about venous system now. So this is blood supply or blood draining from the gastrointestinal tract um, has obviously collected lots of nutrients and goodness from food and it's also collected some bad stuff and uh, so all of this kind of this blood that's absorbed from uh, blood that's drained from the gastrointestinal tract so all the um the intestines um needs to go back to the liver and it goes back to the liver so that the liver can process all of the good stuff and filter out all of the bad stuff. So the blood supply to the liver comes from two different directions. So we have um, we have an arterial supply, which again is, is unimportant for you to know. But we also have a venous supply, which is coming from this vein here, which is draining most of this gastrointestinal tract and this is called the hepatic portal vein so you can imagine because the blood uh, because the gastrointestinal tract requires such a huge amount of um blood supply it's also going to drain a huge amount too so the blood that is coming to the liver is uh, a great volume it's a great volume and the liver is uh, very, very efficient at dealing with that volume until it becomes damaged. So, oh, I should take a step back. So we have um, some esophageals. Uh, so at the bottom of the esophagus, we also have branches that are draining um, into the IVC. So the IVC is this one here. Uh, but there also we have some coming into the liver. OK, and it's really important that, you, in fact, I'm going to draw these on because they're not all that clear in this picture. Uh, and I'm very sorry, but it is going to be in red. Um, but we are talking about veins. So we have from the inferior portion of the esophagus, we have um, veins that are also draining into the liver like this so as i said the liver is really good at processing huge amounts of blood and dealing with the 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 pressures and the strains that it's put under in order to carry out its job but when that goes wrong so when we have liver damage that could be either through um you know fatty liver diseases uh, cirrhosis um you know alcoholism we can scar the liver 
And when we scar the liver, it makes its job really hard because now it's going to have to deal with the same volume of blood, but it's not going to be able to process it in quite the same manner. So what's going to happen is, is we're going to increase the blood pressure. And so not the blood pressure overall, but the blood pressure within the liver, which is the kind of the bit that's really important. So we're going to increase this blood pressure. Now, when we do that, when we increase the blood pressure, the blood is going to want to take the path of least resistance. So because the esophagus also drains into the inferior vena cava, which goes directly back to the heart, um, what happens is, is we kind of get all of the blood that's trying to drain into the liver from the esophagus goes, you know what, this is way too hard, the pressure is far too high. And so it starts to try and drain into the IVC instead. So it's got fibres, it's got uh, branches that are coming to the IVC, the inferior vena cava. And when this pressure increases, it takes this kind of alternate route. But what happens then is we have this massive pressure within the veins, or within the venous system of the esophagus. And now these veins are not designed to be um, to be carrying this much volume under this much pressure. So they begin to dilate. So they are widening and widening and widening. But of course, when they widen, the walls also get thinner because we're kind of stretching them out. So the walls have become thinner. And they become thinner, so they are more prone to rupture. And when they do rupture, they could cause massive hemorrhage. So they will um, your hemorrhage into the esophagus, which will then be swallowed. And then your stomach doesn't like the fact that you've just taken in orally, as, as far as the stomach is concerned, um, a whole load of blood. And so the you begin to vomit which is this process here which is called uh, hematosis so um emetosis meaning like you know to be sick and the hemi bit on the front uh, which just describes blood and so here we have some images of those so this is what a normal esophagus would look like so it would be really smooth and really kind of clean and uh you know very pretty looking but esophageal varices, we could see, have kind of, well, they're essentially, they're varicose veins of the esophagus. Um, so when you see them, you know, kind of in elderly people and stuff, we have these varicose veins on the back of our calves and, um, you know, the, the medial aspect of our knees. Um, and this is exactly what has happened within the wall of the esophagus. So instead of this nice kind of smooth, continuous, um, clean region, we have all of these bulging veins and they are obviously very vulnerable to rupture which is what has happened here so because of the giant blood supply to the liver um and the problems that it has created is that now we have um a backup route that has taken through the esophageal varices so the blood loss here will can be absolutely catastrophic it it's a hundred percent an emergency um and therefore um not something to kind of be taken sort of light-heartedly it's an incredibly serious illness to have these esophageal varices and um one of the main causes of death in those um that have died with um liver cirrhosis so, those are the learning objectives that we have covered today. Uh, so, we've looked at the musculature of the tongue. We've named the motor and the sensory supplies to the tongue. We have also defined the nasopharynx, oropharynx and the laryngeopharynx. Um, we've described the musculature of the pharynx and described the musculature of the esoph esophagus and we remember that the pharynx has the constrictors on the outside and the esophagus has the constrictors on the inside. We've also looked at the path of the esophagus as it's branched from 
uh, cervical to thoracic or mediastinal esophagus. And then finally, the abdominal esophagus as it pierces through the diaphragm just before it enters the stomach. And then we've also had a look at um, how liver diseases can induce esophageal varices. So it's all about kind of making the liver really hard, um, building it up with scar tissue, increasing the blood pressure. And so the blood is going to look for an alternative route. And that alternative route from the blood that would drain from the uh, inferior portion of the esophagus into the liver now goes, you know what, I'm going to go upwards instead and I'm going to drain superiorly, but then the walls cannot hang, uh, cannot handle the increase in blood pressure. So, like I said, I apologise for the quality of this video. I know it's not been quite as entertaining as normal, um, but I will be working on trying to fix the issue that I have with my uh, very silly computer uh, over the weekend. And so you will have the choice of which way round you want to look at it, or you can look at both. Um, but I wanted to have something out and ready for you today um, because I know how um, you like to follow the timetable that you have scheduled for you. So um, yes, I will see you on the other side and hopefully the video will be up and resolved.